evening. Uh, my name is Daniel. I work here at the Quag Wildlife Refuge. Now, the Quag Wildlife Refuge is this wonderful 305 acre nature preserve, and it was established here in 1934. Now, originally at the refuge, it started out as an ice company. So situated right on the opposite side of this building, it overlooks this wonderful um, pond called Old Ice Pond. Now, Old Ice Pond um, was used for ice harvesting, and eventually it turned into um, a sanctuary or refuge for wildlife. So um, it was just a little bit of a background on uh, where we're from and uh, what we do here. And so we are going to talk about hummingbirds today. So I will um, share my... Um, presentation right here. Wonderful. All right. So um, we're talking about the wonder of hummingbirds. Now hummingbirds, um, let me just one moment. I'm just gonna see if I could turn off my video right here. One second, pardon me. <laughs> there we go. There we are. Okay. So um, the, hum the hummingbirds, um, we have 325 species in the world. Um, we have one species here on Long Island, and that would be the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, you can see in the picture in front of you what, what an artistic representation of one would look like. And we also have eight species here that regularly breed in the U.S. Hummingbirds are only found in the uh, Western Hemisphere, and there have also been sightings of the Rufus hummingbird, which um, uh, researchers have determined that um, some have changed the route traveling east um, before they reached the south during their migration period, and which is why they could be sighted um, in the eastern states, usually between October and January. There we go. So the ruby throat bird is the one that we have here on Long Island, and they have uh, bright green or emerald green backs. Now, um, it's important to note that um, they do have this ruby red throat on the pouch, but those um, that redness is not pigmented. It's actually this reddish, uh, brilliant red color because of the iridescent microscopic structure of the uh, feather barbicles. Um, so within the feathers are these tiny, tiny little barbs. And um, th that's so bright and iridescent, that's what gives it this brilliant red color. Um, they also have gray and white underparts and this br uh, bright green or gold green backing on them as well. Um, the ruby-throating hummingbird also has short legs. They can't actually walk. Um, they kind of just hop around um, and that's really the, the extent of their uh, terrestrial mobility. Um, and they have a maximum weight of about 0 0.2 ounces, which is about a quarter or about two and a half paper clips. Okay. So um, as I said that the ruby throated humber is on Long Island, we have, we're going to talk about the habitat and distribution. And so within the Eastern North American deciduous woodlands, we have them. Um, they're also found throughout the Canadian prairies. We have old forests, forest edges, orchards, meadows, uh, stream borders. And they're also found um, in their winter and um, non-breeding season um, in Mexico's dry forests, as well as their citrus groves. Okay. And um, the ruby-throated hummingbird as well has the largest breeding range of any hummingbird um, around. So regarding the migration and flight, they have these long winter migrations. Um, they have a flight up to 30 miles an hour, and they can dive at about 60 miles an hour. Um, when they do migrate, they have um, a 500-mile trek. It's a nonstop across the Gulf Coast uh, through to Mexico. And um, they typically arrive on Long Island in May. And they'll typically be seen until like the end of August, um, 
maybe towards like mid September, early October. Um, they flap uh, their wings at um, average of 53 beats per second. And so they have extremely high metabolic demands. So they have the highest um, blood temperature of any mammalian species, except for shrews. Um, so when they're at rest, they go into what's called torpor. Now torpor is not quite a hibernative state, um, it's like a semi hibernation. And so when their heartbeat goes down to about 50 beats per minute, and that it starts from about 12,060, um, I'm sorry, um, 1,260 beats per minute. So with that drastic change, you can really see um, how much their heartbeat slows down. Um, they utilize so much um, energy um, just to travel. And it's really just amazing to see the drop in their heartbeat and temperature really just for when they go into rest. So uh, when the ruby-throated hummingbird uh, nests, they prefer a, a deciduous or a carnivorous uh, trees. And they will also use uh, human structures as well. Um, here at the refuge, we do have a few different nests. So um, not just the, the, the nesting areas, but we have feeders for them. So they would be like a reddish um, glass structure that we have. And we have a kind of sugar water inside and that makes for an excellent diet for them. Um, for also with their nesting, it's typically made of thistle, dandelion, and it's held together with either spider silk or pine resin. So they do go about finding um, certain materials to fortify and build their nests. Um, they also typically disguise the nest with lichens and lichens are a type of a non-rooted plant. You'll typically see them growing on the side of trees, on tree bark, usually like this lightish green flaky kind of plant material. They're incredibly small as well. They're two inches in diameter and they're about one inches deep. And that's big enough to hold not only the mother, um, but as well as one to three eggs um, that they may lay in a clutch. And um, when it comes to building the nest, the female is the only one who builds the nest. It's solely her and she cares for the young and can have many as three different broods per year. And so sometimes um, when um, they, they build the second nest that they can, um, it's for the, because the first brood has fledged. So they will build a second nest for that. And here are some photos just to really give you an idea of the of the nests. So in the first, uh, the top left picture, you can see a clutch of two eggs and you can really see the lichen that's um, that they use to disguise the nest. So you can see it's all around, wrapped around it, really just blending in so perfectly well into the environment. In the top right, you can see the diameter. It's about as wide as uh, a penny, the entire diameter of it. And we can also see in the bottom two photos, uh, a mother hummingbird. Uh, and you can see her sitting in the nest just to really give you a comparison with that penny to how big this hummingbird is, incredibly small and tiny. So the feeding and the behavior of the hummingbird, uh, they consume about half their weight in sugar daily. So as I talked about before with um, in the feeders, sugar water is an excellent um, nutritional source for them due to their high, my, high um, metabolism. And they feed between five to eight times per hour. So at our butterfly gardens where we do have um, ruby coated hummingbird nests, we can often see them um, during the proper time where they'll be returning back and forth to go to these feeders. Um, they visit hundreds of flowers each and every day. So um, they'll be constantly going around. And um, just a little side note, here at the refuge, we have over 24 um, different active beehives. So not only do we see hummingbirds here as well, but we also see tons of these wonderful honeybees going around, um, just constantly collecting the pollen from them. Um, the 
Uh, the hummingbird is omnivorous, so they also have a diet of small insects, spiders, and they sip the sap from trees and juices from fruit. Um, and they have a great uh, color vision. They can see in a different spectrum than we can due to the um, the cones in their eyes, they can see in an ultraviolet spectrum as well. So um, not only is it your typical red, blue, yellow, green, uh, indigo, violet, rainbow spectrum, but it really shows um, almost like a heat signature in their visual spectrum as well. They are attracted to red orange flowers that are unscented and they mostly grow in full sun. Um, so in addition to those other insects, they do enjoy gnats, fruit flies, mosquitoes, caterpillars, and um, aphids as well. So those just um, those really tiny insects provide enough protein for them. And these are three different kinds of hummingbirds as well. So we have the smallest one, which is on the right. That is a bee hummingbird. That is the smallest species of hummingbird. You can see it just perched on the uh, eraser of a pencil. And the ruby throated one is on the left. So you can see it going for some uh, nectar within a flower. You know, a uh, short segment um, prior to me working here at the Quag Wildlife Refuge, I was involved in wildlife rehabilitation. And there was one time, um, just speaking from personal experience, where we did have um, a ruby throated hummingbird as one of our patients. Now, it was really interesting to see how we uh, were able to supplementally feed them. And what we ended up using was um, a really tiny um, eyedropper that had sugar water in it. And they have this incredibly long and thin tongue where they will flick it back and forth within the end of that eyedropper, really just uh, licking up that sugar. And it happens so quick. You can really just see them just dipping that tongue in and out, just really getting all the nutrients that they need. So um, talking more about the diet, um, they some ornithologists, um, people that study birds, um, suggest that spiders are between 60 to 80% of their diet and insects that are essential in providing a lot of vitamins, minerals, amino acids, proteins, oils, fats, and fibers. Um, the nectar provides quick energy to sustain their extremely high metabolic rate, um, rate and that's due to their immense um, speed and how often that they flap their wings. They really are expending a lot of energy, so they really need to supplement it with as many um, food sources as they can. Their bills are narrow and long and they must use super speed and maneuverability in flight to collect, their, uh, collect prey. Um, since they are flying at such a rapid rate, they can hover almost mid air. And um, that's really what they use to continue eating at a flower. Um, they have a forward motion in flight, which helps them then move their food down their throat. So they're really using their environment to help them digest. Okay. And so um, these are our hummingbird feeders. Um, they're usually filled with a, a sort of sugar water. So to attract a, a ruby throated hummingbird in your own backyard, you would wanna provide one of these feeders. Um, flowers are also an excellent way to see them around. You'd also wanna provide them with a sort of shelter, water and a sort of perch area for them and as well as the nest material. So if you have um, lichens that are um, nearby, that would also be excellent for them. Um, and the nectar feeders, which I was, um, spoke about far beyond prior to this um, to the slide. So um, colorful parts are a great um, kind of feeder. Ours, as I said, was this bright red color. And because they can see in that ultraviolet spectrum, it really helps attract them. Um, you don't need to color the nectar at all. And the sugar water mixture is about one cup of water to a quarter cup of sugar. And that would provide enough nutrients for them. Um, several spots out to feed is best. So there has multiple openings on the feeder. So we can see in this photo here that there are a few at the different areas. So, um, and you can see that there are little perches as well. And so um, the feeder, you'd wanna keep it clean and out of direct sunlight because that sunlight can spoil the sugars that are within the, um, the feeder. Um, 
Yeah, we don't. Um, sorry, I misspoke. Um, you didn't want the sugars to ferment within the um, the feeder. Um, the best time that you'd want to leave out a feeder, I uh, know it's not on the slide, is within late April. And that would help um, with their early arrival um, and for those that are flying north. And these are a few other photos that we have um, showing all the different variances and um, all the different feeders that you can potentially have for the root or the hummingbird. If you want to keep the uh, hummingbirds coming back, you want to make sure, um, as I said, you want to clean them properly um, on a regular basis. Um, say every every about two to three days would probably be the most um, ideal cleaning um, regimen for it. And the flowers that you want available for them to be able to feed on, you want to have a large variety of them. So the variety is key. So you want to plant flowers that will bloom at different times throughout the season. Also, native plants are a wonderful addition for you to have for the, um, for the hummingbird. Um, you want to have uh, the native plants to grow them, and the hummingbirds have a long association in which plants serve as a reliable source of nectar at the same time each year. And you want to kind of think like a hummingbird. Uh, think like a hummingbird. You want to think uh, vertical, so trellises, trees, garden sheds, anything to support climbing vines and create a terraced effect, and that would provide a variety of species. And maintaining the plants is also key to the hummingbird as well. By pruning, uh, pruning the plants, you prevent the woody growth, and you want to uh, favor the flower production. Because by having the flowers there, you are providing the most kind of nectar available for them to eat. And you want to avoid um, all insecticides and herbicides as much as possible, being that the hummingbird will be feeding directly from it. Okay, some of those native plants that you would want to plant would be cardinal flowers, uh, trumpet honeysuckles, jewel weeds. You also have red morning glories trumpet creepers and bee balm. And just looking at these pictures, you can really see and um, think back to the earlier slide with the hummingbird with the really, really long thin beak. These flowers here, they have a really long um, body to them and the hummingbird is able to get all the way into the very bottom of that flower. The perches that you want to have available for the uh, hummingbirds are between uh, 10 to 20 feet of the garden if there are no natural perches available. Natural perches being on the thin, long um, branches for them to be able to rest on. Um, a few things about the perches as well. Um, you wanna make sure you have plenty of safe spaces for the hummingbirds to nest. Um, sleep in the yard. And you wanna have um, no more than 10 to 15 feet um, from trees or shrubs. Um, the males can be territorial, so you want to provide them with open and obvious spots to rest, and you want to survey um, to survey the yard. Females are more skittish than the males, and they prefer protected areas hidden from view. Um, another good um, rule would be so, like clotheslines, twigs, overhead wire, shrubs, trees, and vines. So for the water sources, um, each day they take in as much as eight times of their body weight in water. So they are constantly drinking, but it, um, it's not a massive amount considering that they're only about the weight of two and a half paper clips though. <laughs> uh, the hummingbirds will sip from the dew soaked leaves in the mornings and other sources as well. Um, they prefer sprinklers over most bird baths and that is due to the way that they do drink their water. So the, uh, the sprinklers will, will moisten the flowers and they'll be able to get the dew soaked um, and the off of the, the flower petals. And you would want to provide spots like shallow and elevated bird baths. Um, even though they do prefer, say, like sprinklers because of the water that they provide, they do um, like shallow bird baths, though. Um, you want drip, drip fountains and misters available from them as well. 
And um, but however, it is important to know that um, that's not the most vital thing for them, as most of the water that they um, come that they do obtain comes from uh, flower nectar. Um, and the the reason why they would prefer a shallow over a deep bird bed is because most bird baths that are available are what just far too deep for them because they are just so tiny in size. Okay. So here are some excellent examples of the water feeders that we you can provide these uh, for the hummingbirds. So we could see them in the top left and the bottom right there are have um, the little statuettes on them. And so for the hummingbirds, uh, you can notice how incredibly shallow those are. Some of them are, uh, they are elevated off of the ground for them. But the, the, being that they are so shallow, they um, it's not too deep for them to sink in or that they would feel uncomfortable in. Okay. And um, their nesting materials. Um, so when planting for hummingbirds, you wanna include plants that can be used for nesting material. So cinnamon fern would help fortify the inside of the nest, um, dandelion, pussy willow, as well as thistles. And um, before we spoke about the hummingbirds also use spider silk, believe it or not. Um, they will use cotton fibers, fuzz or hair from leaves, feathers, and small bits of bark and lichens. Okay. So additionally, um, you would want to tie red ribbons to trees and things in your yard so hummingbirds will spot them from overhead. I know we're kind of uh, speaking a lot about the, um, the spectrum that they can see, but the bright colors really do attract them, being that they do feed from a lot of the, uh, the flowers. How bright they are really is a great indicator, and it does attract them um, really, really well. And once you start attracting hummingbirds, and they discover your property, it's likely that the same individuals will return each year. Um, they are migratory and they will typically stop at the same spots um, when they do return back. So if you are successful in having the ruby-throated hummingbird in your own backyard, um, it's very, very likely that you will see them again in the future. And uh, finally, um, persistence really is key for the um, for having hummingbirds. Um, oftentimes, even myself included, have had set up feeders in my own backyard and wasn't successful. Um, I still am not successful to this day. However, I do try every year. I know here at the refuge, they are successful in having them come back each and every year. And I do see the, the ruby-throated hummingbird at the same feeders fairly often. Okay, and we'll open it up. Um, does anyone have any questions? We'll see if okay. Let me see. All right. Just give me one moment. We're I'm still getting used to this whole Zoom thing. So I'm gonna see if I could look into the chat to see if there are any questions that are being typed. No? Okay. All right. So that is the end of the slideshow. Um, so just a few things. Um, with, the, with the hummingbirds, I know at the end of the slideshow, we did say the persistence is key, and you really can't give up. Um, if you are attempting to see them in your own backyard. You really have to be persistent and just keeping up a great um, setup for them to be able to visit. And sometimes you are just unlucky in the aspect that sometimes we just can't get them to stop. Um, they might have also had um, stopped at a previous stop that wasn't too far beyond uh, or behind where you might have been set up, setting up a nest. So they just decided not to stop there. But um, really just keep um, persisting at it and you will hopefully one day get lucky in seeing them in your own backyard. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you for the program. Good night. Thank you. Oh, I do see a few questions that were posted. So, um, uh, okay. So just to answer those questions. Um, so uh, the first one was, how does the bird feed its young with such a long beak? Um, the hummingbird is extremely maneuverable and they use that beak just have, um, uh, they can use their beak just fine. Uh, the length of it really doesn't play an impact whether uh, um, in their feeding ability with their young. Someone had asked if there is a refuge for hummingbirds on the North shore. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know of one, so I'm sorry. I couldn't be able to answer that question for you. Um, some, I saw what other things besides red ribbons can attract the hummingbirds. Um, not just only ribbons, but just brightly colored flowers in general. I can't think of anything specific that's synthetic that you could use, but any, really anything comes to mind. Um, so long as it's brightly colored. I see the most ideal time to take in, take in the feeders for the year. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not entirely too sure when their migratory period ends. So I don't know when the best time to stop leaving the feeders out is. Um, obviously when it gets a little bit too cold, um, you wouldn't be able to see them though. And the last one is, do we study the hummingbirds we attract? Um, no, um, as a refuge, we are a home to uh, the wildlife. We don't participate in any kind of scientific studies of these hummingbirds. We just have the feeders up just to really just look at their natural beauty that they provide. Okay. Okay. And what are the most likely times of day when hummingbirds come to feed? Um, they're mostly diurnal, meaning that they are mostly active during the daytime. So um, throughout the day, um, from mornings through afternoon, you'll often see them. They do um, nest um, towards the evening. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right. All right, guys, thank you so much for attending um, the presentation. Um, we are um, open 365 days a year. Um, every single day we are here, we have to feed the animals and we are open from sunrise to sunset. Additionally, um, across the street from the refuge, we do have what's called the Fairy Dell Boardwalk. And that is um, this boardwalk that extends out into the, um, uh, into the water. And it's just this, real this, um, it's so beautiful. Uh, and right now we do have a nesting pair of osprey out there. So if um, you are to come down to the refuge, I do recommend you take a walk into our Fairydale Boardwalk and take a hike on one, our wonderful uh, seven miles of hiking trails. Okay. All right, guys, thank you so much for um, attending the presentation tonight.